Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And today we have the cat. Our our cat that, that stares into our souls with its big scary blue eyes because because it's thinking that we should be worshipping it because it is a cat and that's what cats do and believe and want. So uh, today we're doing uh, episode three of the Cat Who series, which uh, you may have noticed I have called Quillerish Ramblings because I wanted to give the series a title and I'm really, really bad at titling things. So um, here we are with the cat who turned on and off. Um, now this... This is not the cover of the copy that I own, mainly because I wound up having to buy a brand new copy from a, uh, a Chapters or Indigo. I don't remember if it was at a Chapters back when Chapters was still just Chapters and not, you know, Chapters Indigo. Um, but I had to buy this brand new as opposed to the cover that I had originally read when borrowing it from the library. But anyways... So, book three in the series. This is a continuation of the Quillerin working in the feature department thing that he started off with in the first two books. But this time, Quillerin gets himself into trouble. You know, because in the first book, he has to take the job, and if the job is working on and doing art criticism when he knows nothing about art, well, he needs the job. And in the second one... Well, if that's what you're assigned, then you're doing this. Uh, you you wind up doing the interior decorating stuff. In this one, Quill is starting this book, as per usual, in a state of financial and personal distress. Um, his stay at the apartment in the Villa Veranda that he had managed to get himself in the last book. Um, was it the Villa Veranda? There are so many places and names in these series. Um, anyways, he that that's finally run out, and so he's having to stay in a hotel. A hotel that is less than enthused about him having Siamese cats, because Siamese cats are loud and trouble and loud, and um, most hotels don't really like it when you have loud pets. Uh, so he's in desperate need of a place to live, and he also, his inner competitive nature has come out because the newspaper that he works for, the Daily Fluxion, is having a competition, a, you know, best article competition, and if you do well enough, you get a frozen turkey. I don't really know what he wants with a frozen turkey, because I'm not entirely certain Quill would know how to cook it, but he wants a frozen turkey. So, so he's looking desperately for some kind of material to write a Christmassy sort of uh, article, when the cab driver in the cab that he's taking home informs him that they're in junk town, and that there are, you know, junkies here, and People are, it's a terrible part of town, and people are always taking drugs, and it's the worst. And he decides, this will be perfect. This will be the best thing ever to, uh, that, uh, just the best thing ever for him to write an article about. And, you know, he's going to write a big tearjerker, Christmas in Junktown, look at all of these sad junkies who will not have Christmas. It's terrible, and, and we're sad, and, and all kinds of horrible things. And so, he goes to Arch Riker, who is his old friend and the feature editor, and he proposes the idea of Christmas in Junktown. We don't get to see Percy, the uh, managing editor, at any point in this book, but that's okay. Because, of course, Arch Riker starts talking about how, oh, Junktown would be a great story. Why, Rosie's got me into it. And, and that's when Quillerin discovers that Junktown is not, in fact, full of junkies. It's full of junkers. Now, the difference between a junkie and a junker is not the difference between a Trekkie and a Trekker. 
um, that is, I would say, arguably not much at all. It's the difference between a person who takes lots and lots of illicit drugs to, you know, get high, and a person who likes looking at and buying antiques. That's the difference between the two things. And after Quill makes a few snide remarks, his old good buddy pal Arch decides to take revenge and orders him to write the article. So Quill has gotten himself into this one on his own hoof. And, uh, but while he's there, he manages to find a place to live, and that's when we meet Iris Cobb. Iris Cobb is another character who appears later in the series. She's not particularly bright, but she's a really, really good cook who makes really, really excellent uh, tasty desserts and, and all kinds of things. There's a lot of food in this series. Like, every single book... Um, I don't know if it's because Lillian Jackson Braun likes talking about food or if she's just trying to make it a character detail... That, that Quillerin is really, really interested in food. But all of these books are very, have a very uh, significant focus on food. This one is, of course, no different. As Quillerin uh, winds up having some really lovely uh, apple pie when he first meets Iris Cobb and agrees to rent a place from her, she cooks him breakfast one time. It's it's a really... And there's focus on it. There's discussion of things. There's... When Mrs. Cobb's husband dies, um, he does eventually turn out to have been murdered. But when he dies, one of the things Quillerin asks her in an attempt to keep her from sinking into shock, is asking her about her secret ingredients in her coconut cream pie. And, or no, it was a coconut cake. The, the thing is, though, food. It's, it's really, it's very much a factor in these books. It was a factor in the first book, when Quillerin spent so much time with, uh, uh, with his landlord and art critic, um, who has the lengthy name starting with an M that I don't remember, because I don't remember names. I never remember names. I can remember Ms. Braun's name because it's on the screen in front of me right now, and I can see it, and it says Lillian Jackson Braun. If you ask me names, uh, for the most part, I, I don't, I don't, names, no, things, no, bad. Um, also, as you can see, I have a limited grasp of the English language. Uh, so, the thing is that, as before, the, the murder investigation really kind of takes a secondary role to Quillerin interacting with Coco, to Quillerin taking Coco to places to help him investigate. It takes a second, uh, place to, uh, Quillerin listening to Mrs. Cobb talking about the ghost that haunts the house. It takes a second place to him and his uh, relationship with Mary Duckworth. Mary Duckworth, who is in fact part of the illustrious, illustri illustrious, I can't talk today, the illustrious Duxbury family, who are one of those super rich people who have, you know, large amounts of money sunk into getting large amounts of influence on cities and things like that. And, uh, Quill winds up sort of in a relationship with her, that there was this guy, Andy, who is sort of actually the reason that Quillerin becomes most interested in Junktown. That, you know, at first, at first when he gets there, it's the, oh, I've gotten myself into another beat about things I know nothing about and I'm not interested in, and now I have to cover it. But... Within a very short time of his arrival there, of his investigation there, uh, we hear all about the death of, uh, of poor Andy. And Andy 
uh, he is one of the antiquers, one of the people who own and and run the uh, one of the antique stores there. And uh, the thing about that is that uh, is that that's what really gets his attention, um, as murder always does. And so a large portion of this book is about his investigating with that and his investigating into Andy's ex-girlfriend, who is Mary Duckworth. Um, but clearly he and Mary Duckworth get a thing because... At the end of the book, the last paragraph um, involves the two of them. Uh, involves the uh, let's let the author being at least a little bit subtle, saying that in the moments that followed, the pair on the daybed were blissfully unaware of the two pale apparitions hovering over the dinner table in the vicinity of the pressed duck, because uh, Coco and Yum Yum want their pressed duck, which. They weren't supposed to have because Quillerin was saying that they'd already had uh, smoked oysters and they shouldn't have any more food. So, of course, when their pet human and their pet human's new female friend decide to sink blissfully onto the daybed, they take advantage of the moment to have the pressed duck, which is, after all, their due because they are cats. Um, and so most of the characters in this are not repeat characters. Um, but Iris Cobb is. Iris Cobb makes the transition in this series to the post-switch to pickaxe. And uh, the attorney, I believe it's Richard Mouse, again, as always, I don't prepare for these things and I don't remember names, so... While I remember his last name is Mouse, M-A-U-S, Mouse, um, I, I, and the first name starts with an R, I'm probably wrong, and, you know, I, I, I don't prep. Um, I do this for fun, not for money, so if any of you, um, is, is expecting great, great skill and, um, and elucidation of, of, fascinating and intellectual concept, you had better look somewhere else because this isn't the channel for it. Um, so I... We get this introduction of another character who becomes a semi-regular later in the series, and we get another round of Quiller and interacting with many, many just fun and silly, strange characters. And that's kind of... As I've said before, that's really, that's the key to the series, is, is this, th this interaction of Quillerin, who is, in many ways, staid and normal with wild and kooky characters. Um, it's something that my father, who has a PhD in English and knows things about literature, said, is that it's like Alice. Alice is a very, it's from Alice in Wonderland. Alice is a very dull little girl, but that's what makes her such a wonderful narrator, that her dullness, her lack of, of creativity, of all of those sorts of things, make her a really, really excellent narrator because it thins that wall between the experience of the reader and the experience personally of actually being there. And with Quillerin, while he is certainly has some very strong perspectives and beliefs and opinions and likes and dislikes, we're getting we're getting this these books through the eyes of somebody who is used to being very observant and very verbally eloquent. And it makes for a very excellent experiential sort of experience. Um, this is, this is a series that's sort of about visceral experience, about viscerally experiencing food or places or people, which is another reason to uh, quite like it. And I think that's all the time I have for today. Thanks for coming.